recently. God, it's so cold. <laughs> All those people listening to us up in the north are going to be like, you bitches. It's so cold. It's been 65 degrees, but it's slightly the rain. drizzly. It's the rain. Yeah, but back home in East Tennessee, they just Isn't got like a, a foot of snow in the last 24 Isn't hours. Isn't there a song like that, though? It's the rain. Some I don't know. People, no, no, no. I have absolutely no clue. So, Ashley. <laughs> you're disgusting. <laughs> what are you drinking today, Ashley? Water. <laughs> Water. I need so much hydration. It's hey, not even funny. I was supposed to be drinking kombucha today. If you're going to talk with your mouth up against your microphone, can you try not screaming so you don't blow people's eardrums out? I'm so sorry to all the people, but I am drinking water. 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 Hydrate. I am. I'm, I'm hydrating. You know why? Because I'm now a Stanley Cup club member. And it's the... Stanley. Yeah. The, the, the type... The, the viral... The, the pilot, yeah, the popular one. Yeah, the viral TikTok-y. Thanks, Mom. Mom got it for me for Christmas. Thanks, Shan. What are you drinking? Your cocktail looks so cute. What is it? Tell me. So, we recently, and we'll go in more into this, uh, recently found a book... At the good old Barnes and Noble. Of her. And it's called, excuse me, Drinking. Excuse me, you're gross. No, be quiet. Um, it's called Chilling Cocktails by author Jason Ward. And so I'm going to start drinking my way through the chilling cocktails as our producer, Zach, is available to make them for me Thanks, as Zach. we record. Um, as long as they don't have to watch the movie that correlates with it, then I'm so in. Oh, I don't know about that. I might have to have you do that. But uh, today scary. I am drinking... Um, from Dusk Tequila Dawn. Dusk Tequila Dawn. What, what movie is that from? That is from From Dusk Till Dawn, the 1996 movie oh. starring Quentin Tarantino and George Clooney and some other folks. Didn't Quentin Tarantino direct movies? And he started movies too? I don't know. I, I haven't actually ever seen this movie. I'm going to have to do it and read up. I haven't been able to read up on this drink, um, but they come with uh, comprehensive backgrounds to them. But it is technically just a tequila sunrise, uh, which is funny because it's talking about dusk till dawn. So it's hilarious. It's chilling. It is. So <laughs> we are going to do something a little bit different today. Um, and we're looking at playing with some fun episodes where we're just doing some normal talking chatting about our lives and mm -hmm. doing some educational stuff so today we are going to be trying out an educational episode for you guys on the yes, history of orlando are. and all that stuff but we do still want to give you guys some of our normal life updates before we start doing that yeah that sounds um, great hey what's going on in your life oh what's going on in my life so i am officially on a gluten-free diet for the next month join the club Welcome. i am on day what is this four four this is day four uh, has it the, really been only four days? It has. The wow. first two days were a little rough. I spent a lot of money on food because I didn't know what I was looking for, so yes, I just did. bought stuff. Yes. Um, but we have uh, done some fun things. We went to Barnes & Noble. This is where we found the, the cocktail book. Yes, we um, did. To look specifically for a gluten-free cookbook, uh, which we found by... Um, that was one that's by the company, right? Heron, the Heron Publishing Company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to start cooking our way through that. They gave us 175 recipes with that. Was that the, the gluten-free cookbook the gluten or the gut cookbook. health? No, the gluten-free cookbook is the one that gave us 175 recipes. Oh, the okay. gut health gave us 200... I think it's like 200 and something... Yeah, and that book is written by Lindsay Maitland Hunt. Oh, yes. And she goes by that middle name. Proud of her. So I'm super excited for us to start going through that. And we'll definitely keep you guys updated and tell you guys about some of the fun stuff that we're doing. I was introduced to the wonderful world of uh, Tater Joe's. Trader Hoes. Or, as you all may know it. As a correct name. Trader Joe's. <laughs> uh, we met some really fantastic staff while we were in there. Had some great views while yes. we were in there. Yes, we did. Um, and we got some advice on our gluten-free journey. And let me tell you, if there's anyone out here that is gluten-free or looking at being gluten-free, Trader Joe's really is a great place. It is a very small store. There's not a lot to it. Correct. But there were so many options there that were gluten-free. They have, uh, when it comes to their breads and bakeries, they have a whole section designated to it with... Uh, 
like uh, pastries and breads. And then throughout the entire store, if you come across anything gluten free, it is clearly marked, marked. Oh, yeah, on yeah. the shelf in front of the item. So you yes, don't have is. to try to read the labels, which is really neat. Yeah. it's And I mean, I think even Trader Joe's is good for those even that are not gluten free. I think it's an inexpensive grocery store that you can grab everything that you need. I mean, me and the roommates, we, we go there about twice a week. So yeah, no, big fan. Um, and then we found something else and we decided to do something fun and crazy I'm at Barnes and Noble. Why don't you talk about that? I'm so excited because I am an avid book reader. I, I received a Kindle, um, for my birthday and I am, I'm a huge fan. So now I kind of get to like bring you into my book world and I'm really excited. So we've decided that we are going to do an Orlando Unplugged book club. <laughs> Um, so our first book is What uh, What Mother Won't Tell Me by Var Leon Menger. Um, if I am mispronouncing that, I am so sorry. Um, and if you want to join us, I will be sure to put that on our Instagram and our Facebook page so you can join along and read along with us. What Mother Won't Tell Me is a book. It's a Nordic thriller with a folktale twist about a young girl who's raised in a strict isolation. She's protected by cruel people and from the outside world. And she soon realizes that the most dangerous strangers are those that aren't outside. They're inside the bedroom across the hall. Bum, bum, bum. It sounds exciting. I'm very so, excited. We want to fair warn everyone. There are definitely spoilers ahead for this book. So if you're reading it, please be advised. We'll definitely let you guys know. Absolutely. Um, before in the podcast, before we start talking about it. Uh, be and, warned. and all of those things. And if it comes down to it, our goal is to just read one chapter per week and discuss that one chapter at the beginning of every episode. But if we find out that we're going on a tangent too much with the book, we may actually um, do an entire episode do, based on the book. <laughs> do just, uh, well, I was thinking maybe, I don't know. We'll figure it out. But, Absolutely. But yeah, I'm super excited for that. That's a lot of fun. So if you guys want to join us again, that book is called Won't Mother, What Mother Won't Tell Me. Yes. By Ivar Leon Menger. We know that you can get it at Barnes and Noble. Yes, you can. Um, so, and I believe he's also uh, the book is also on Amazon. It just came out. It's only been out for about a week now. So seriously, um, yeah, seriously. Oh, wow, we got lucky. Yeah, yeah, we did. We got real lucky because I guess there's a book called Barnes and Nobles that it's actually already sold out. So that's awesome. Find her, join her, join us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you got going on? I got a lot of things going on right now. Like. It's crazy. So my work life has been absolutely insane, but I've got some really exciting things, um, movements and going to potentially different hotels. I also have um, a couple just to be honest with you, it's just a lot of work things. I've got a lot of work stuff going on. Um, I also for those of you that follow my personal page, um, I've got a couple updates on that sweet baby Bruce. Um, she was pretty sick all last week. Um, she, she wanted to be like her mom. You know, she wanted to, to have some kidney issues, so she got a nice little UTI, um, so we're managing that, we're dealing with that, and after a nice 200 and something vet bill, thank you pet insurance, um, I think we are taking a step in the right direction, as she stares at me with intent, because she's mad at me that I've had to give her medicine every single day this week. <laughs> hey, Liquid she's medicine. Doing, she seems to be doing a lot better, though, from, from yeah, last week. She's, yeah, yeah. Up, moving around. Yes. Um, you're going to hate me for this. And please, if your sister's listening, don't hate me for this. But last <laughs> night, I love Brucey. Last night, she was being a little shit. Ugh, she's never a shit. Listen, she Bruce and I talked about fully, this. And she said, you're, she you're full of shit. She fully <laughs> put her face she in did. my tea last night. Like fully, <laughs> nose and mouth, completely submerged, air bubbles coming yes. out. Uh, and then she knocked over a glass at like one o'clock in the morning and spilt water all over the coffee table, all over our games under the coffee table. It was a good time. It was great. We bonded. For you. I'm really glad. Mm -hmm. Listen, she's got to get to know her uh, Uncle Dustin. There you go. I know. And I tried to like wake you up and you were just over there talking in your sleep. <laughs> I do not talk in my sleep. You talked in your sleep. I don't make me bring Zach in here and confirm. Okay, Zach will like semi-confirm, but I'm pretty sure there's other people in my life that may deny that statement. Hey, hey Ashley. Hey, what? Do you know what next week is? It's Knoxville trip. I'm not counting down or anything, but it. I got a notification that we leave in nine days. I I'm well really nine excited. days from the sixteenth. So when you're hearing this on Monday, it will only be four days. That is, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, because we are recording this episode a week early. Oh, one last thing I'm going to talk about uh, about the book club before we go any further is 
Um, we will not be talking about it next week. No, we will not. With us going to Knoxville. So it'll be two weeks, uh, two episodes out from now. Correct. Will be the first time that you guys are hearing us yes, talk about the I'm, book club. I'm, I'm hoping that next week's episode is about Knoxville. It is going to be about Knoxville All and Chocolate Fest, Chocolate Fest and the Ronald McDonald House, which benefits from uh, the Chocolate Fest event and a I'm bunch so of excited. other things. So um, with that being said... Um, I just want to, before we start, though, I, mm-hmm. I really would like to thank everybody for listening to last week's chaotic episode and for not judging me too harshly when I tried to tell you that you all could go to the Legacy Store, even though it is very much closed. So It's okay. We'll only judge you in silence. Yes. And if anybody has my cup, anybody knows where it is, saw the guest that took my cup, you can return her to me. Kill him. Please. Hey, Ashley. Hey, what? Do you know what officially went live the other day? What officially went live the other day? Orlando <gasps> Unplugged Podcast.com. Yes. yes, we have our own website. And I am super excited, guys. So if you guys want to check it out, you can head on over to www.orlandounpluggedpodcast.com. And there you can see all of the streaming sites and streaming platforms that the podcast is hosted on. We are everywhere from Google Podcast, Apple, to things like Deezer, Alexa, Tune In, um, Podwatch, on all everything. sorts of places. Yeah, and it has a link to all of our social media channels, including yes, our YouTube. Yeah, and um, everything is all linked. It's nice and pretty Oops. in that one spot. So, and yeah, I'm so excited and it makes it so much easier now. So yeah, no, it's great. Check it out and give us a, a follow. Give us a like on, on everything. So yeah, it's gonna be great. I'm, I'm really excited. excited. I'm really excited. So let's do it, Ashley. What are we talking about today? Oh my gosh. Do you know what I just realized though? What? We are skipping. So grab a cocktail or a mocktail while we unplug Orlando. <gasps> In living color. Oh my God. All right, guys, welcome back. Um, We've got a lot of fun things to go over. So one thing that we wanted to tell you guys is we've decided uh, to make this a little more fun. Uh, One week, we are going to do an episode that's just about us, the fun adventures that we're having in Orlando. And uh, the following week, we are going to kind of give you guys a bit of a history lesson on the places, the businesses, the things, uh, anything that has to do with Orlando and Florida. Um, So we're going to kind of go back and forth every other week. Don't Um, worry, there won't be any tests on this one though no pop quizzes no pop quizzes but I love no more quiz. terms yeah but maybe our listeners don't i okay, never like those fine they make me itchy <laughs> so for this week's episode we had uh we have a lot planned so we decided that we are actually going to go ahead and break down our history of city beautiful into two episodes so this week we're going to have part one we're going to go over kind of the founding of orlando some of the uh major theme parks in the area next week we're going to come back and talk about our trip to new york New York. You mean Knoxville. I mean, wow. we can definitely plan a trip to New York. I'm so game for that. Yeah, let's do that. But let's go to Knoxville first. <laughs> yes, we're going to go to Knoxville. I'm thinking New York because Knoxville's currently covered in snow like New York is. Yes, it is. I'm not looking forward to it. I have to like re now bust out all of my winter gear from Michigan that I had happily put in a box. That'll be okay. It's just a few days. But um, it's kind of cute. So I'm really excited to bring it out again. Yes. Um, but then after uh, next week's episode of uh, our trip to Knoxville and Chocolate Fest, we're going to come back to part two of The City Beautiful and we will wrap up and uh, finish up that and then we'll go from there and bring another history lesson the next time absolutely so I'm looking forward to it I'm really excited because we learned so much during this time like when we were doing all the research for all of everything about Orlando we learned so much so I can't wait to like share it with you guys it's gonna be so good so for this episode uh, as we we break it down we're gonna do part one and then part two um, so this is part one we're gonna talk about city beautiful especially to all of our listeners who are not from here. Do you know how Orlando got the name City Beautiful? Ooh, no, no. Can you, you want me to tell you? 
Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you. So apparently, according to Steve Spear with uh, the Florida Plus Life, it turns out that uh, the history of this name labels back more than 200 years, sometimes between the 1890s and the 1920s. uh, An urban design trend that was called the City Beautiful Movement was sweeping through the United States. So cities like Chicago, Cleveland, Kansas, they were all embracing this idea of making parks and other landscape features the focus of city centers. And the thought behind this is that it would improve the morale of city residents. Um, So if we look to um, another author by the name of Evan Bacon. Mm, Bacon. uh, And the book (laughs) Orlando, A Centennial (laughs) History. Orange County sent a group of agricultural exhibitioners uh, to the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And it was there that the City Beautiful Bug was caught by this group. And shortly after their return, according to city records, we started to see... um, Uh, City planners begin to incorporate more oak trees, palm trees, azaleas, flowery shrubs, and water oak trees, um, which is, as we know, very prominent in today's society here in the Orlando Orlando architecture. It's pretty much everywhere. Do you know where you live? Yes. (laughs) I struggle. Um, But eventually, so the city decided to sponsor a contest to replace Orlando's original nickname, which was the Phenomenal City, which I really don't like. So I am glad they changed that. Absolutely. Um, And they wanted to go with something more contemporary. So out of all of the suggestions, the City Beautiful was chosen and adopted. I really love that. And I love that we get to to kick it off this episode with some history about it. We get to touch base on on a couple things. So I think we should give them an overview on what the entire series is going to be about. And then that way we can specify what exactly each episode is going to be about. Sound good to you? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, one thing I do want to say before we get started and we we'll discuss that there are going to be some form of verbiage in here that both myself and Ashley sometimes struggle to pronounce. So Those if we do impro- uh, pronounce anything incorrectly, we are sorry. We apologize. We tried really hard, but yes. Hey, hey, buddy, how do you say seminal? Seminal, mm-hmm. not simoleon. No. Or simile. No. Seminal. Yeah. Okay. And you're going to mess that up when you say it, aren't you? Yep. All right. Here we go. Oh. I lost my whole notes. Cause oh, you're good. You're good. So uh, to start off, we are going to talk about the city's early days as a settlement around Fort Gatlin and the pivotal moments during the Seminole Wars that led to the renaming uh, in honor of fallen soldier Orlando Reeves. So proud you said that word. We also cannot forget to talk about the impact of transportation with the arrival, with the arrival of the South Florida Railroad in the not late 19th century because it definitely played a crucial role in shaping the city's growth. Mm -hmm. And just outside of Orlando, there's the aerospace industry centered around Cape Canaveral. While it's not directly in Orlando, it was a catalyst for economic growth in the mid-20th century. Uh, And I definitely feel as though that has impacted the tourism uh, patterns in Orlando. So we're going to discuss that. And we're definitely planning a trip out there to check it out, uh, potentially looking at doing a two-day trip even. Um, Maybe we can plan it during a rocket ship launch. You know, there was one yesterday, and I missed was it Was there again. really? Yep, it's the fifth one since I've lived here, and I've missed it. Love that for you. I know. Um, but we're, uh, don't worry, we're going to bring you out for all of that fun. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, and we cannot forget uh, the completely game-changing effect when Walt Disney opened their doors in 1971, which personally, I think between that and the aerospace industry, completely changed the trajectory of Orlando for the modern times. I couldn't agree more with you. However, Disney was just the beginning, though. We'll also be discussing the parks that came after, including Universal Orlando Resort, SeaWorld, and the now defunct Wet n Wild. We will, and that will actually wrap up what we're going to be discussing today. But we want to go ahead and give you guys a sneak peek at uh, part two. Sneak peek. So when we start discussing our part two, we're going to look at the economic impacts of Orlando from tourism to the Orange County Convention Center, or as me and Ashley like to call it, the OC3. OC3. To Brightline, which is a new high-speed rail company that is... uh, growing very quickly very, in very uh, Orlando. Um, and then we'll even discuss citrus production. So Orlando definitely has a lot going on. It really does. We're also going to shine a bright and shiny spotlight on the educational institutions that have contributed to the city's growth, such as the University of Central Florida, Go Knights, and Valencia Community College, which uh, is actually right down the street from us. And speaking of growth, we'll end that episode with Orlando's booming population, making it one of the most populous areas in metropolitan Florida. That's probably why traffic is so bad. It is. So, um, Ashley. 
So here we go. So make sure your glass is full. Find a comfy spot while uh, we unplug Orlando. Nestled in Central Florida, Orlando stands today as a vibrant city, overflowing with life, culture, and entertainment. However, to truly, truly appreciate the tapestry of Orlando's present, we must kind of unravel its past. So the story begins in Orlando in the mid-19th century, when settlers began to establish a community around Fort Gatlin, a U.S. Army post built to provide protection during the turbulent times during the Seminole Wars. Originally inhabited by the Tamuka and the later Seminole peoples, our, again, our apologies if we mispronounce those names, the region began to witness the infusion of new culture as pioneers sought to build life on this fertile land. Named after Aaron Jernigan, an early settler, the town was initially called Jernigan. However, the winds of change were blowing and the city's destiny was about to be shaped by a completely different narrative. As tensions escalated during those Seminole Wars, the town underwent a transformation that would etch its name into history books. Orlando Reeves, an army sentry, became a symbol of sacrifice during these tumultuous times. His life, however, was tragically cut short, but it left a lasting mark on the community. In 1857, the town was officially renamed Orlando in honor of the fallen soldier. This act not only paid homage to a local hero, but it also laid the foundation for a city that would rise above its military origins and grow to become a beacon of culture, commerce, and community. Now, before the American Civil War, Orlando served as a center for cotton and cattle. It, this contributed to the economic fabric of the region. The landscape was dotted with vast expanses of farmland that reflected on an agricultural economy that sustained the growing community. And the aftermath of the Civil War brought about significant changes to Orlando's economic landscape. Citrus emerged as a leading industry, transforming the city into a hub of orange groves and citrus production. The sweet aroma of orange blossoms began to define the region, laying the groundwork for the city's agricultural prominence. This can be found even now as you drive through the central parts of the city. In 1880, the South Florida Railroad reached Orlando. It connected the city to broader networks of trade and transportation. This was a pivotal moment that marked a turning point in Orlando's development. This facilitated a, move, a movement of goods and people and catalyzing the economic growth. The extension of the railroad uh, to Tampa in 1883 further solidified Orlando's position as a key player in Florida's emerging economic landscape. The rhythmic chugging of trains became a soundtrack to Orlando's progress, echoing the promise of the future brimming with possibilities. Jumping forward in time, in the mid-20th century, the quiet shores of Central Florida witnessed a transformation that would echo throughout the history books. Cape Canaveral, once a serene coastal region, emerged as the epic center of aerospace industry. This catalyzed... Cat <laughs> Words and I, we just get along not so well. This Catalyzing? Catalyzing. Catal <laughs> we struggle sometimes. It's okay. I'm staring at the at Bruce, so I'm going, this cat. <laughs> An unprecedented era of economic growth for the region. Nestled along this pristine Atlantic coast, Cape Canaveral was initially chosen as a missile testing site by the U.S. military in the 1940s. Its strategic location offered a vast expanse of open ocean, providing a safe tra direct trajectory for <laughs> test flights. As tensions rose during the Cold War, the site transitioned from military use to becoming a crucial player in the growing space race. That pivotal moment came with the establishment of the Kennedy Space Center in 1962. The state-of-the-art facility became the cornerstone of America's space exploration efforts as it propelled the nation into the forefront of technological advancements. Those iconic launch pads of Cape Canaveral echoed with the thunderous roars of rockets as each launch a testament to human ingenuity and ambition. The establishment of the Kennedy Space Center not only marked a giant leap for space exploration, but it also became the launch pad for economic prosperity for all of Central Florida. The influx of scientists, engineers, and support staff transfor uh, transformed the region into a thriving community. Skilled professionals flocked to Cape Canaveral, creating a demand for housing, schools, and other various services. 
The aerospace industry demanded for specialized skills that led to the creation of numerous job opportunities. Engineers, technicians, and a plethora of support staff found employment in and around Cape Canaveral. The region's educational institutions adapted to meet the evolving needs of the industry as well, as they offered programs that nurtured the next generation of aerospace professionals. The economic surge in Central Florida spurred expansive infrastructure development. Highways, schools, hospitals, and recreational facilities sprouted up to accommodate the growing population. Cape Canaveral, once a remote outpost, became a bustling community with a dynamic economy that reached far beyond the confines of the space center. As the aerospace industry flourished, its positive impact ripped, rippled through various sectors. Local businesses catered to the needs of the workplace experienced a boom, from restaurants to retailers to real estate agencies. The economic diversity diversification shielded the region from the overdependency on a single industry, as this ensured a resilience in the face of economic fluctuations. And in recent years, Cape Canaveral has once again captured global attention with the rise of space tourism and commercial space ventures. Private companies attracted to the region's rich aerospace history and favorable launch conditions have set up operations, further contributing to the economic vitality of Central Florida. Tourists from around the world flock to witness rocket launches, injecting tourism dollars into the local economy. While the aerospace industry brought unparalleled growth, it also posed challenges. Economic fluctuations tied to changes in space policy, budget constrictions, and shifts in geopolitical dynamics occasionally impacted the region. However, the resilience of the community and its ability to adapt to changing circumstances ensured that Cape Canaveral remained a symbol of progress and innovation. Now, the aerospace industry's growth has also prompted increased attention of environmental sustainability. Efforts were made to minimize the ecological footprint of launches, and technology advancements aimed to reduce space debris and pollution were incorporated. Cape Canaveral, once a site solely associated with exploration, became a model for responsible and sustainable aerospace practices. It really has, as the aerospace industry's profound impact on Central Florida goes beyond economic matrix. It forged a sense of community, pride, and engagement. Residents became stakeholders in the space missions, in attending launches. They even participated in educational programs. And they definitely, definitely celebrated the region's role in pushing the boundaries of human achievement. Way to go, guys. Now, jumping back a little in time, in the early 1960s, Walt Disney, the visionary behind the iconic Disneyland in California, set his sights on a grand undertaking in the swampy heart of Florida. Little did the world know that this venture would blossom into the enchanting wonderland that we all know as the Walt Disney World Resort. Now, Walt Disney World's story begins with Walt Disney himself, who envisioned a larger, more immersive theme park experience on the East Coast. Acquiring vast tracts of land in Central Florida, Disney's ambitious plan included not just a theme park, but an entire resort complex. Now, unfortunately, Walt did not live to see the rest of his dream come to fruition as he passed away in 1966. However, you can bet his legacy definitely lives on through the dedicated teams that carry his vision forward. You want to tell us a bit about the parks? I really, really do. In 1977, Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom opened its gates to the public as it forever changed the landscape of Orlando. Epcot, known once as Epcot Center, opened in 1982. Now, Disney's Hollywood Studios, known as Disney MGM Studios, opened in 1988 to 1989, followed, which left Disney's Animal Kingdom as the last resort to open in 1998. Each of these parks brought a new, unique charm to the sprawling resort. The iconic And that iconic Cinderella castle has become a symbol of enchantment, inviting guests in a world where imagination knows no bounds. Hey, Dustin. Yeah? Do you know what my favorite Disney park is? What? Epcot. Did you know what it was originally planned by Walt Disney? It wasn't supposed to even be a theme park? No, it wasn't. Yeah. So Epcot actually stands for the Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow, which is something that Walt wanted to do. And if the vision would have actually come to fruition, um, you would have been like in the center and there would have been large towering buildings that featured offices, schools, stores, pretty much like a modern day downtown, but it would all be in one giant building. And then going out from the city center in a straight line would feature forms of public transportation like the Tomorrowland's People Mover. And that would take guests from the city center out to their homes in the suburbs. No way. Can you imagine what Orlando would look like now with that in place? I know. It would be very interesting, actually. 100%. Oh, my goodness. Tell me. Oh, my goodness. Tell me. 
a thing. I just got an email from a thing about a thing, and we'll discuss off the air, but hopefully I'll have some maybe some exciting news for you guys in the future. But Yay! anyways, we'll get back on topic now. Um, so the arrival of Walt Disney World had a profound impact on Orlando's economy. The influx of tourists brought jobs and opportunities, promoting a surge in uh, tourism, Uh, and construction, um, hospitality, and other service industries. Local businesses thrived as the tourism industry began to flourish even more, and the city evolved from a quiet town uh, focused around citrus production to a bustling metropolis. Uh, Walt Disney World became not just a theme park, but an economic engine that fueled the nation's growth. It it definitely did. And over the decades, Walt Disney World has continued to to innovate and expand with the introduction of Epcot that brought a futuristic and educational dimension to the resort while Disney's Hollywood studios celebrates the magic of the silver screen with Disney's animal kingdom being the fourth theme park. It welcomed guests blending entertainment with the conservation efforts. The 1990s saw the advent of themed resorts and water parks. The contemporary and river country were the first to be add, um, to be added to the repertoire and create layers uh, to immerse Disney guests in the experience. Later on, the creation of the Disney Vacation Club provided guests with the opportunity to own their own piece of the magic, fostering a sense of community among Disney enthusiasts that's or we, Disney adults. That's what we need to be a part of. We need to be a Disney Vacation Club member. Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. But while Disney World's embraced its technological advancements, it also continually enhanced the guest experience. With the introduction of the Fast Pass system, magic bands, and the interactive attractions that showcase Disney's commitment to blending entertainment with cutting edge technology, the parks have definitely become a beacon for the state of the art storytelling with attractions like Avatar Flight of Passage at Disney's Animal Kingdom setting new standards for immersive experiences. Now, beyond Orlando, the Walt Disney Company has expanded its magical footprint globally. Disney theme parks now enchant visitors in California, Paris, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. The cultural influence of Disney has permeated societies worldwide, with its beloved characters, movies, and franchises becoming touchstones for generations. Now, Walt Disney World has faced many challenges over the years, from the economic downturns to natural disasters. However, the resilience of this company and its commitment to guest satisfaction has led it to continuous adaptations. With the acquisition... uh, the Yes, the acquisition... (laughs) Acquisition. Acquisition. Not accusation. Acquisition of Pixar Animation Studios, Marvel Entertainment, and Lucasfilm. This has infused new creativity into the Disney universe, ensuring the parks remain at the forefront of the storytelling and entertainment. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic Boo. presented an unprecedented challenge to global to the global tourism industry. And this does indeed include Walt Disney World. Temporary closures, reduced capacity, and health and safety measures tested the resilience of these parks. However, the company's adaptability was paragon to the introduction of enhanced safety protocols and the expansion of virtual experiences, and a renewed focus on guest and cast member well-being. Absolutely. Walt Disney World's impact extends beyond economic matrix. The resort actively engages with local communities through charitable initiatives, educational programs, and environmental stewardships. My personal favorite, the Disney's Conservation Fund, for instance, supports local and global nonprofit organizations to positively impact wildlife, ecosystems, and the communities closely linked to their survival. Now, we have only barely brushed the surface on Disney, but we're going to go into even more detail on Disney at a later time. But don't worry, we will definitely be sure we invite you guys along for that fun when we do. Woo! But we want to take a little bit of time to discuss a few other parks that have shaped the landscape of Orlando, but more specifically, the I-4 Corridor. 1980s, Universal Studios set out on a cinematic journey that would forever alter the landscape of entertainment in Orlando, Florida. Universal Studios Florida, the brainchild of the MCA Incorporated and Universal Pictures, opened its doors in 1990 as it offered guests a behind-the-scenes look at the magic of Hollywood. Now, the next park that we will discuss is personally our favorite place here in Orlando, the Universal Orlando Resort. Originally, Universal Studios Florida. Their story begins with a desire to bring the glitz and glam of Hollywood to the East Coast. The park's opening on June 7th of 1990 marked a significant moment in the theme park industry. Located in Orlando, a city already known for its tourism and attractions, Universal Studios aimed to provide visitors with a unique, immersive experience that blurred the lines between film 
and reality. Upon opening, Universal Studios Florida featured a mix of original attractions and reimagined versions of popular Universal Studios Hollywood rides. The park's iconic entry entrance arch modeled after the classic Universal Studios gates welcomed guests into the world of movies. Attractions like Earthquake, The Big One, Confrontation, and Jaws captured the imagination of visitors as they sh were showcasing the studio's ex ex expertise? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Words today. <laughs> and creating thrilling and cinematic experiences. The success of Universal Studios Florida prompted a wave of expansion throughout the 90s. In 1991, the park introduced the dynamic entertainment district Universal City Walk, offering a vibrant mix of dining, shopping, and nightlife. The Hard Rock Cafe, Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville, and how do you pronounce it? Emeralds. Emeralds. I always want to call it Ermelis. <laughs> Emeralds Restaurant Orlando were among the first establishments to grace City Walk. Do you know what replaced Emeralds? What? Big Fire. I love Big Fire. So good. While in 1993, the park unveiled its first major expansion with the addition of my personal favorite park, the Universal's Islands of Adventure. It was a groundbreaking theme park that would later become a part of the Universal Orlando Resort. The Islands of Adventure looked to the literature to bring iconic attractions like the Amazing Adventure of Spider-Man and Jurassic Park River Adventure as they further solidified Universal's commitment to pushing the boundaries of theme park storytelling. Now, as the park entered into a new millennium, a shift occurred in the way that Universal Studios Florida presented itself. The concept of a working film studio gradually gave way to the focus on more immersive experiences and attractions inspired by popular franchises. We saw the classic attraction Confrontation close to make way for the present-day Mummy starring Brendan Fraser. Universal partnered with Lowe's Hotels and Company to build extraordinary resorts across its campus. This dynamic of collaboration seamlessly blends the magic of Universal's theme parks with the luxury and comfort offered by Lowe's Hotels and Company, creating an unparalleled vacation experience for their visitors. One of the most transformative moments in Universal Studios Florida's history occurred in 2010 with the opening of the Wizarding World of Harry Potter and Islands of Adventure, my personal favorite part of violence. I thought I could die from. <laughs> this magical expansion in collaboration with Warner Brothers brought to life the enchanting world created by J.K. Rowling. In the winter town of Hogsmeade has allowed guests to step into the pages of those beloved books and movies. Universal realized, which they should have very quickly, that it was so popular. While the decision was made to close Jaws at Universal Studios and replace it with Diagon Alley, building Hog the Hogwarts Express as an innovative way for guests to travel between each of the parks. And you know, the thing I love most about the Hogwarts Express is it's a different ride in both directions. It really is. So it's a different experience mm -hmm. each way. And now we're seeing the construction of a third Harry Potter themed land in Yay! Universal's Epic Universe, which is set to open sometime in 2025. However, Universal has not confirmed if that area will be themed to the direct IP of Harry Potter or the Fantastic Beast and Where to Find Them, which is another J.K. Rowling book and film based inside the same wizarding universe. Can you imagine? The evolution of Universal Studios Florida continued with the opening of Universal's Volcano Bay in 2017. This water th theme park introduced a new level of innovation and water attractions, featuring the towering Krakatau volcano as its centerpiece. You can literally see that on an I-4. Mm -hmm. With a focus of technology, immersive theming, and unique water experiences, and the best tacos I've ever had, Volcano Bay has become a key component at Universal Orlando Resort. And the ongoing commitment to expanding and enhancing the guest experience has led to the introduction of additional attractions, such as Fast and the Furious Supercharged, because we're all family here, <laughs> The Race Through New York starring Jimmy Fallon, and The Bourne Stunt Spectacular which is personally my favorite attraction at Universal Studios. Oh, it's so good. These attractions incorporated cutting-edge technologies, live-action stunts, and immersive storytelling aligning with Universal Studios Florida's mission to captivate audiences with unforgettable experiences. Have I ever told you that Universal actually tweeted me back one time? No way. So they had a, twi uh, a tweet about... Um, if the world is filled with Born Stunt Spectacular fans, uh -huh. they're there. If the world only has one fan, they're there. If there are no Born Stunt Spectacular fans, then they no longer exist on this planet. <gasps> and I tweeted them back and said, it's my mission to watch the show from every angle of the theater because it is a different show because you get to see things that you don't always see from uh, the center if you're really close to the stage and vice versa. I'm a tech guru, so I like to see those things. Nerd. And they tweeted me back and they said... That they believe in me. They believe in you. And they also told me and you that not all heroes wear capes. 
because we went through Camp Jurassic recently and made sure that there was no Indominus Rex activity there and that we made it out safely. So thank you, Universal. We, we are your heroes, even though we don't wear capes. We, we barely made it out. But you know what Universal is doing really, really well at right now? What? They're looking to the future. Yes. Because in 2019, Universal announced its plans to open their fourth park, Woo-hoo. Epic Universe, which I think is going to be... I did it last episode. It's going to be epic. Epic. I hate me too, guys. From what we have seen and read, guests will enter the park and find a centralized location based on a steampunk celestial theme. As they surround the center of the park will be portals that will take guests to heavily themed lands. Now, I do want to reiterate um, what Ashley just said here. From what we have seen and read. So we cannot confirm nor deny it. any of this is true. This is based solely off of what we've seen. I'm the one who came up with the word steampunk, and I've heard uh, some of our friends, we refer to the center of the park as a celestial theme, Mm -hmm. because it seems to be very spacey. Um, So keep in mind, we are not here to to confirm nor deny. This is just our best guesses. And once all those things do come out by Universal and they get confirmed, we will be sure to share them with you as soon as we nailed them. Mm -hmm. So going back into that, so many IPs, or as what we refer to in the film industry as intellectual properties, have been rumored to be at the park, including, um, and what seems to be potentially uh, our best guesses, are How to Train Your Dragon, Harry Potter or Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, Universal's Classic Monsters, which I hope is kind of like Halloween Horror Nights, Gross. and Super Nintendo World. Uh, now, in February of 2023, Mark Woodbury officially announced, who's the CEO of Universal, he officially announced that Super Nintendo World was indeed coming to Epic Universe, and he called it the worst kept secret in history. However, the project was delayed indefinitely in July of 2020, thank you to that pandemic, but... Excitingly, on March 3rd of 2021, Comcast, the now owners of Universal, announced the immediate restart of construction. In March of 2023, Mr. Woodbury also announced that they would be renaming Universal Orlando Resort to Universal Destination and Experiences, with Universal's Epic Universe dropping that apostrophe S and just becoming Universal Epic Universe. And with this new park, we are also seeing the addition of Stella Nova and Terra Luna, two new value resorts. And um, looking at the concept art from Universal's Epic Universe, excuse me, Universal Epic Universe, it appears that Universal is creating what's potentially going to be their grandest resort yet. Um, And it's, uh, if you look, it's the very large building in the center of um, the concept art. Um, And like I said, we are thinking that this may potentially become the new flagship resort for the Universal company um on may 5th of 2022 universal actually offered 13 acres of land where epic universe was being built for a bright line route commuter station which is that high speed rail that we're going to be talking to you guys about in part two and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about this um but they pretty much stepped in to claim the direct line to uh to orlando international airport west palm beach boca raton uh, fort lauderdale aventura and miami after disney pulled out of uh their proposal with bright line And what I think is probably the most exciting news to have come from Universal Studios in a hot minute is um, recently Universal Studios said that it was looking into the possibility of building a theme park in the United Kingdom after purchasing 480 acre parcel of land near Bedford, England. Now, the land was purchased by the Universal's parent company, Comcast Corporation, in August of 2023 for $271 million. Um, Now, we've not gotten any more information out of that, except for recently, the residents who reside in the town of Bedford received official letters from um, the Comcast NBC Universal Company stating that um, they did indeed buy the property, um, but they're not saying there is for sure a park going in there and that uh, if they do plan to build a park, that the residents of the town of Bedford will be the first to know and that Universal will be working with the community if that decision is made. The queen would get a part you, well, can you imagine the king? Long, long live the king! Boo, queen! Uh, no, I need the queen to have a part though. That woman needs like a statue in this new park. Yeah, true. Maybe she'll have one. Oh gosh, I hope so. Ooh, maybe they'll have like entertainment, like a show about her. The Crown. You know they did. They did create a Netflix show. show. 
called Princess Diana. It didn't go over well with people in the UK. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Okay, but, but anyways, back to Universal. Beyond its role as an entertainment destination, Universal Studios Florida actively engages with the community through charitable initiatives and educational program. The company, like any major entertainment complex, faced many challenges over the years, economic downturns, changing consumer preferences, and external factors such as that annoying COVID-19 pandemic. It, it presented many hurdles. However, the park's resilience, adaptability, and commitment to guest satisfaction allowed it to weather these challenges, emerging stronger and more innovative each and every time. Way to go, guys. And yet again, just like with Disney, we have only barely brushed the top of Universal. Now, I know we've talked about Universal in a previous episode, and we do plan on going back to the park very soon. Oh, yeah. So don't worry. We'll invite you along. Now, just down the road from Universal, SeaWorld Orlando has emerged as a maritime haven that seamlessly intertwines education, conservation, and entertainment. Since its inception, SeaWorld Orlando has evolved from a marine-themed park to a comprehensive destination that not only captivates visitors with thrilling attraction, but also plays a pivotal role in marine life conservation and education. Now, SeaWorld Orlando's story begins in 1973, when the park opened its gates to the public. It was conceived by a team of, of visionaries, including George Millay, Milton Shedd, David Des Moines, and Ken Norris. And SeaWorld aimed to provide guests with an immersive marine experience that went beyond traditional aquariums. The park's opening marked the expansion of SeaWorld's brand, which already had, a, already had two successful parks in San Diego and San Antonio. Now, while the early years saw SeaWorld Orlando establish itself as a premier um, marine-themed uh, park, that's a hard thing to say, marine-themed park. Woo! Uh, featuring marine life exhibits, live shows, and attractions, the park's commitment to marine education and conservation was evident from the start, with exhibits showcasing the diverse array of marine species and habitats. And SeaWorld Orlando has set itself apart by incorporating education into its core mission. The park section eight educational initiatives aim to foster an understanding of marine life, ecosystems, and the importance of conservation. Educational programs, live presentations, and interactive exhibits allow guests to connect with marine life on a much, much deeper level, as this sparked an appreciation for the oceans and their inhabitants. Now, over the years, Seawater Orlando has been actively involved in marine conservation efforts. The park has participated in rescue and rehabilitation programs for injured and stranded marine animals, working in collaboration with organizations dedicated to marine welfare. Through initiatives like SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund, the park contributes to global con uh, conservation <laughs> projects, emphasizing the need to protect marine environments and wildlife. As SeaWorld Orlando grew, so did its repertoire. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yep. Of iconic attractions and entertainment offerings. With the introduction of popular shows like Shamu Believe and One Ocean, these featured the park's resonant killer whales as they became a symbol of the SeaWorld experience. Their all inspiring performances have showcased their intelligence and grace of these marine ambassadors while conveying important messages about conservation. Thrill seekers were drawn to the adrenaline pumping rides like Kraken, Manta, and Journey to Atlantis, blending the excitement of theme park thrills with the allure of marine themed storytelling. The park's ability, ability to balance entertainment with education became a hallmark, creating a unique destination that catered to a diverse audience. Now, at the start of the new millennia, SeaWorld Orlando expanded its portfolio with the introduction of Discovery Cove. This boutique park offered an intimate, all-exclusive experience, which allowed guests to interact with dolphins, snorkel with through coral reefs, and even unwind in a tropical oasis. By God, I want to be there right now. Discovery Cove's emphasis on close encounters with marine life provided a more immersive and personalized experience for its guests. Aquatica, SeaWorld's water park, made its debut in 2008, adding another dimension to SeaWorld Orlando experience. Combining water attractions, animal encounters, and thrilling slides, Aquatica became a refreshing addition to the Central Florida's water park scene. The park's innovative attractions, including the Dolphin Plunge and Ray Rush, continued the tradition of blending excitement with marine-inspired uh, marine themes. 
Now we do kind of want to take a moment here real quick before we start our next little bit about universe or about SeaWorld. And we do want to just give a small bit of a warning here. We are going to touch on a small topic that might be a little scary, a little, I don't want to say offensive, but it just might be a little, it might be too much for some of our listeners. So if you're not a fan of listening to pretty traumatic events or pretty traumatic um, uh, things that have happened, I would skip ahead a little bit um, and, and meet us up when we talk about our wet and wild experience. SeaWorld Orlando has experienced tragic incidents involving the loss of beloved animal ambassadors, which has deeply affected both the park staff and visitors. One such heartbreaking incident occurred in 2010 when a veteran trainer, Don Brancho, tragically lost her life during a performance involving Tilikum, one of the most famous killer whales. This incident garnered widespread attention and prompted SeaWorld to change its safety protocols and procedures. The parks implemented comprehensive changes, including the suspension of all close contact performances with killer whales and the implementation of enhanced safety measures to prioritize the well-being of both animals and their ambassadors. The loss of Dawn was a somber moment in SeaWorld's history, leading to a commitment to the continuous improvement and heightened focus on ensuring the safety and welfare of all marine ambassadors and wildlife. This prompted them to face challenges with public perception, particularly related to the treatment of their killer whales in captivity. Documentaries and public scrutiny prompted SeaWorld to reassess its practices and make significant changes. In 2016, the park announced the end of the, its orca breeding program and the phasing out of theatrical killer whale shows, making a paradigm shift in the park's approach to animal welfare. The park's commitment to conservation and education remains steadfast, with an increased focus on showcasing the natural behaviors of marine animals in a more naturalistic environment. The evol evolution of SeaWorld Orlando's mirrored changing societal attitudes towards animal welfare and Environmental responsibilities. And in 2009, SeaWorld Orlando 19? introduced... Did I say 2009? You did. I pulled a U. I know. In 2019, <laughs> SeaWorld Orlando introduced Sesame Street Land, a whimsical addition to the park that delighted families and children. The themed area brought beloved Sesame Street characters to life, offering interactive experiences, rides, and entertainment for younger visitors. Sesame Street Land showcased SeaWorld Orlando's adaptability and commitment to creating experiences for guests of all ages. And isn't that your favorite part? We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> SeaWorld Orlando has continued its dedication to innovation with the opening of Icebreaker, a roller coaster featuring multiple launches and a unique rever and a unique reverse launch element. The park's ability to introduce cutting-edge attractions while maintaining a focus on marine conservation reinforced its status as a leader in the theme park industry. And they did Icebreaker, and then that didn't they haven't they just recently? Yeah, we just got a new one. one. Um, Do you remember what it's called? I no. It's something Surfer, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's, is it, what is it? Hang on, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. You do that. I will. Beyond the role of uh, it being a major entertainment destination, SeaWorld Orlando actively engages in local community through outreach programs, educational partnerships, and conversation initiatives, or conversion... We just got too excited. Conservation initiatives. The park collaborates with schools, environmental organizations, and community groups to promote marine education and conservation welfare. So they got Pipeline. Pipeline. Pipeline was the next one. And then guess what they just announced? What? That's coming this year. Oh, the Penguin Ride. Penguin Trek. Penguin Trek. I'm so excited did you hear that. what they just announced, though, with this? No. That you're going to end the ride in the penguin exhibit. So, the so you're going to freeze after you get so scared. <laughs> the ride that was there previous, which I think was also called Penguin Trek, yes. was a trackless ride that you would get in and Correct. you would ride through the building. It was kind building. of like for those that have ridden Ratatouille, similar concept. Yes. A um, little bit older, but similar concept. Yes. Um, but yeah, it was essentially the same thing. So I think this is going to be the same thing. They're just replacing an, an older, outdated form of a ride attraction with something new and thrilling. With a roller coaster. Bum, bum, bum. Speaking of future, SeaWorld has remained commitment to, committed to its core principles of education, conservation, and entertainment. The park has continued to evolve, embracing technological advancements. It's expanded its conservation efforts, and it's introducing new and innovative attractions like Penguin Trek that have continued that will capture and continue to um, bring our guests a deeper connection to the oceans. And just as our previous two theme parks. This, again, is only the tip of the oh, iceberg. I can't wait because we have so many things planned with SeaWorld this year because SeaWorld has, I think, probably the best food setups ever because I'm a big, big fan of all of their, like, their their food um, 
what's it called? The festivals. Festivals. Thank you. I could not Mm -hmm. come up with that word. I really like those. And I'm really looking forward to introducing you to all of those. Yeah. So like I said before, we'll definitely let you know when we're there. Keep an eye on our social medias for when we are there and all that fun. And you'll be invited. Yeah. So I think that it's time for us to talk about wet and wild. I really The defunct water park. Absolutely. Next, we're going to discuss Wet n' Wild Orlando. Once the epitome of aquatic inter- excitement in Central Florida, closed its gates in 2016, leaving behind a legacy of water-soaked memories and thrilling experiences. Now, this iconic water park situated on International Drive had a storied history that spanned nearly four decades. From its opening in 1977 to its closure in 2016, Wet n' Wild captured the hearts of visitors with innovative water attractions, a- exhilarating rides and a vibrant atmosphere. Now, Wet n' Wild made a splash onto the theme park scene in 1977 under the visionary leadership of George Malay. Yeah, that same guy who founded SeaWorld. As as it pioneered the water park industry, this park was groundbreaking for its time as it introduced the concept of water-themed amusement park with a variety of innovative attractions. Now, one of the park's standout features was the revolutionary Lazy River, an attraction that allowed visitors to leisurely float along a winding course, soaking in the Florida sun. This seemingly simple attraction became a staple in water parks worldwide, illustrating Wet n' Wild's ability to influence the industry. Now, Wet n' Wild Orlando has continued to evolve and expand throughout the years, introducing a plethora of groundbreaking attractions that set the standard for water park experiences. The Black Hole, a pioneered enclosed water slide with thrilling twists and turns, and The Surge, a multi-person raft ride, were just a few examples of the park's commitment to innovation and excitement. Now, perhaps one of the most iconic attractions at Wet n' Wild was Bombay. Now, this unique slide featured a trap door that dropped riders into a nearly near vertical descent, creating an adrenaline rush that became synonymous with the water park's daring spirit. The Bombay exemplified Wet n' Wild's reputation as a trendsetter in the water park industry, inspiring similar attractions around parks worldwide. Wet n' Wild also embraced the nightlife entertainment with the introduction of the dive-in movie scene, where guests could float in the wave pool while enjoying classic films projected onto a large screen. This innovative approach to combining water-based fun with cinematic experiences added to that extra layer of excitement to the park's offering. Can you you imagine Jaws while sitting in a lazy river? I'm not going to lie. You said dive-in, and I thought of... Mel's die in sign at Universal. Are, are you hungry over there? No, I just, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I but would yeah, be Jaws terrified, and that though. would be hilarious. That would, I would not be hilarious. I'd be scared. I would get one of those little fins that can swim through the water, little remote controlled fins. And remind me never to go to a water theme park at night with you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so as the years passed, Wet n' Wild faced increased competition from newer water parks in the area, with the planned opening of Universal's Volcano Bay and other themed water attractions that shifted the dynamic of water park entertainment in Central Florida. Despite its competition, Wet n' Wild continued to draw in crowds with these classic attractions, beloved slides, and the sense of nostalgia that endeared local uh, locals and tourists alike. And in 2016, under the management of Universal Destinations and Experiences, that's probably why they played Jaws. Oh my god, I'm getting it now. Wet n' Wild Orlando announced its closure, marking the end of an era for water park enthusiasts. The decision was part of Universal Orlando's broader resort plans for expansion, leading to the closure of the iconic park to make way for Universal's endless summer dockside and surfside resort. Universal also opened Volcano Bay Water Theme Park in the following year, just across the road. I love that park. I love it. And I love that resort. It's so good. Mm -hmm. I actually have some interesting stuff about that momentarily. So the closure of Wet and Wild Orlando was met with a wave of nostalgia and a sense of loss among those that had created lasting memories within the watery embrace. The park's legacy, however, lives on in the hearts of those who experienced its exhilarating rides, the lazy river, and the family-friendly atmosphere. Now, when you go... To Universal's Endless Summer Surfside Resort. So Dockside is across the street in what used to be the parking lot of Wet n' Wild. And Surfside is where the actual park used to be. So they have one pool and they have one bar at that pool. I apologize, I don't remember the name of that bar. But if you go to that bar and you order one of their specialty cocktails, every single one of their specialty cocktails is named after the old rides and attractions. So I'm pretty sure they've got a Bombay beverage, um, 
The sandbar. Yes, that's what it is. The sandbar. Um, but you can go there and you can order a specialty beverage from that bar and they are going to be named after the defunct attractions of Wet n Wild. That is so cool. I love how they're paying homage to that. We're going to have to uh, see if they've got any mocktails that are named after any of the rides. Mm-hmm. That'd be cool. While the impact of Wet n Wild's closure was not just local, but it resonated across the water park industry, the park had left a lasting mark on the evolution of water based entertainment, influencing the design and features of subsequent water parks worldwide. Its innovative spirit, commitment to thrills, and the creation of timeless attractions had paved the way for the future water park experiences. Now, Wet n Wild's la- uh, legacy is also evident in the nostalgia that continues to surround it. Um, former visitors reminisce about the lazy days in the sun, the daring descents down thrilling slides, and the unique charm that defined the park. The emotional connection that people formed with Wet n Wild speaks to its enduring impact on the local community and the broader world of the water park enthusiast. Now, we obviously won't get to go experience this park. Sad. But let us know if you guys hey, are but interested. You know what we get to fi- fix out, to test out <laughs> words. I'm just so excited to talk. What? Volcano Bay. Yeah, we will go to Volcano Bay. And we Bay. can talk about Disney's water park, too, because they have Blizzard Beach and Typhoon Lagoon, which are also very good ones. And we can even check out SeaWorld's Aquatica. And yeah. maybe, maybe we can go to Discovery Cove. Maybe. But if you guys are interested and you would like to hear more about Wet n Wild, let us know. Reach out and tell us, and we can go further in depth and do some more research and maybe speak to some people locally that got to experience Wet n Wild. Absolutely. But you know, you know, Orlando isn't just known for its theme parks. Mm-hmm. The area stands as a vibrant economic hub for the diverse sections that contributed to its growth. So on the part two episode, we are going to discuss the impacts of the Orange County Convention Center, or as we have deemed its name, the OC3. The Bright Line, which is the first privately funded inner city rail line in the U.S. in over 100 years. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, they are the first high speed rail as a private company. Stop. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Yep. They're actually getting ready to expand in Las Vegas, I hear. Wow. Look at Vegas copying us. Mm -hmm. That's a first. Yeah. (laughs) We'll also discuss citrus production, colleges and universities. And the population changes in Orlando over the last 200 years. Wow. Wow. Oh, and we're also going to talk about the recreational gems like uh, Lock Haven and Gatorland. And I'm so, so excited for that. I am super excited. Lock Haven Park looks absolutely amazing. And I'd love to feed you to the gators in Gatorland. No, I'm sorry. No, I'd love to experience Gatorland with you. I'm sorry. Okay. 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 All right. That's fun. Okay. Well, guys, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. And we really hope that you guys enjoy our historical take looks backs. Take looks backs? (laughs) takes back these we hope that you guys Service enjoy guys. our historical episodes um this is something that we want to do with you guys we want to be able to share our community with you outside of just the fun things that we're doing so if there's anything in or around the orlando area that you guys want to know about or you think that we should discuss on the podcast feel free to reach out and let us know absolutely so until next time because we're going to talk about knoxville and i'm so excited <laughs> you ready for the cold i'm i'm, I'm ready for the chocolate chocolate i'm ready for the chocolate that's what i'm really for so um yeah thanks until next time peace out cup scouts bye guys love ya